Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm so glad to see you again uh, with another uh, comprehensive webinar uh, being hosted jointly by Sri Lanka Dental Association along with Commonwealth Dental Association. Uh, today uh, uh, is somewhat a special day because we have uh, 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 some of our colleagues joining in all the way from uh, Caribbean islands. Uh, so I warmly welcome them to our webinar as well. Uh, thank you for joining, um, and I hope you have a fruitful webinar. So uh, I'd like to start the webinar with a brief introduction uh, regarding our speaker. We have a very distinguished uh, personality uh, who has uh, very graciously uh, accepted our invitation uh, to give a lecture on uh, resin retained bridges. So that is none other than uh, Professor Guy Lamborn. Uh, Professor Guy Lamborn is an uh, honorary consultant in prosthodontics uh, and he is a specialist in fixed and removable prosthodontics. Uh, he is attached to Peninsula Dental School in University of Plymouth, United Kingdom. And I'm sure when you see the titles uh, behind his name, he, you can obviously know how much of experience and the knowledge that he has gathered over this time. So without taking too much of time, uh, uh, I will be inviting him to deliver his webinar. Just a quick reminder, if you have questions, please type in through the chat so that I'll be filtering the questions and I'll be forwarding the questions at the end of the webinar. And uh, if you have any uh, doubts or any clarifications, you can also contact me through the same chat. Over to you, Professor Lambon. The presentation that um, Sam has asked me to, to give to you today is really about resin retained bridges. So this is a, 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 something which I've enjoyed over a long period of time. Uh, and in fact, was the first person to bring the, the idea to me to, for, for use of, 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 as a possible treatment modality was uh, Ming Tay, who used to be at the London Hospital, sadly now, no longer with us. Um, and, and Ming was one of the people right at the, the forefront uh, of design of resin retained bridges and wrote a very lovely uh, book, which is probably now long out of date, but had beautiful photographs on, on various different options. Uh, and some of the things I'm going to cover, uh, Ming would recognise. Uh, other things he wouldn't, because things have moved along at quite a pace from the point where Ming was, was researching this. So uh, the, the learning objectives I would like to, to address really are these, and this is why hopefully why you've, you've arrived today, um, just to have a look at the really the reason why we want to consider replacing patients' teeth. Uh, and the picture on, on the lady on the right-hand side um, is one of my patients from practice. Uh, and she doesn't actually have any teeth. So this isn't uh, resin retained bridges. Uh, those are in fact complete dentures. Uh, but you can see the impact it's having upon her um, and her entire uh, facial profile has improved. Uh, her uh, general feeling and verve for life uh, has, has improved dramatically just from the simple provision of a set of complete dentures. Uh, and she was delighted with that. And, and I think we sometimes underestimate the impact that we have uh, as clinicians uh, on our patients. We aren't simple uh, mechanics. We aren't there just to drill and fill and replace teeth or take teeth out. Uh, we have a profound um, social and psychological impact as well. well I want to look at the uh, possible uh, situations where resin retained bridges may be indicated, um, but also to have a look at the evidence base behind um, what we might choose to use, materials, um, various cements, uh, looting agents and so forth, because there seems to be quite a bit of confusion in that area and unsurprisingly as things are consistently on the move and constantly changing. So if you'll bear with me just for a moment, I'm afraid I don't have uh, information for the, the various countries. I know I'm talking to an esteemed audience of, of colleagues from around the world, um, but this is taken from uh, sort of UK data um, it's in 2009, it's from the Adult Dental Health Survey, and that's the last time that this was, was run in, in the UK. And if you look at that graph, you can see that um, a functional dentition, which was defined by the survey as being 21 natural teeth, um, was almost ubiquitous amongst people in the 35 to 44 year age group. But as you look down, you can see that that's disappearing. And by the time you get to the 85 year olds, uh, there's a, a marked decrease in the number of people who've got a functional dentition. So these people are, are 
already disabled in, in some, some factors. And of course, I already mentioned the impact is, is much beyond mastication. It is also the, the social interaction. And I will cover that in more detail as I continue with this, uh, this line of thought. Um, if you, this is a fairly classical question to be asked in the examination sort of cert, uh, situation, isn't it? You know, what pot, you can see the bit of paper in front of you and you have to write the answer. You know, why replace missing teeth? And we'd all quickly trot out appearance, speech, mastication. Um, and this is taken from Davenport et al. And whenever we're talking with our patients, we always try and remember to, to actually put down uh, the, the, the second part of that, which is the prevention of, of undesirable tooth movement. And, uh, and certainly uh, for a very long period of time, uh, I've been warning my patients, if I take a tooth out, you, know, you might get over eruption of a tooth. And I'll explore that uh, in a little bit more detail later on as well. Um, Another thing which I tend to diagnose with my patients, so one of the things I, I do treat in, uh, in practice and in, and in the hospital, is patients with quite often reasonably severe tooth surface loss. So they often have a lack of posterior support. So they're missing quite a few of uh, the posterior dentition. And of course, if we can replace that by some means, we're going to reduce the occlusal burden, the load on the remaining dentition and the remaining restorations, and therefore hopefully uh, make those restorations and those teeth last for longer. I'd like to explore a little bit more in detail though, those main key topic areas which uh, were highlighted by Davenport. And if we look at the literature with regards to aesthetics, um, Silvers certainly wasn't the first person to, to notice that um, anterior teeth had got uh, a particularly important role. I'm sure a lot of you have noticed it prior to him. He's one of the first people to, to actually bother to write that down. Bernie Kieser, uh, also, when he was famously talking about the shortened dental arch theory, did note that the premolars not only have an important um, impact when it comes to, uh, to, to function, but also to the aesthetics. And if you think about uh, most people's smile line, the premolars are in that, uh, in that area uh, for the vast majority of us, and therefore they are functionally important in social interactions. Um, Jamal's paper uh, was uh, from quite an early seminal paper on resin retained bridges. Uh, and from that paper, you could see that resin retained bridges as a treatment option were highly successful uh, when judged by patients. So the patients considered them to be either good or satisfactory almost ubiquitously. Uh, and following up on that, a later article by Botella et al. Um, reiterates this, but more importantly, when asked the question of the patients, would you select the resin retained bridge option again? Almost all of them would do so. So even though they had a resin retained bridge and it had ceased to function, they would prefer to have yet another resin retained bridge over all other possible treatment modalities. And I will touch on, on those uh, in a little bit more detail later. So obviously I've mentioned function, um, but I don't think it's the, it's the key driving part of this. Uh, and it'd be no surprise for all of you that, um, this from Helcomo and others, uh, that as our number of teeth decreases, and clearly this person's got very few teeth, in fact, none in the maxilla, um, as the number of teeth decreases, the uh, masticating capacity or efficiency decreases alongside with it. Of course, that can have an impact not just upon the aesthetics and upon the social interaction we've already talked about, but upon the choice of food that that person is then going to eat. Now, that would, might mean that you don't go out to socialize in a, in, a, in a restaurant or you feel embarrassed so you don't do these things. Um, but it can also mean that you don't then select what would be good, healthy foods. And my grandmother, I, can, uh, I can't ask her for permission to, to relay this story about her now because unfortunately she's no longer with me. Um, but she used to cut apples up. Uh, and as a child, I could never work out why she used to cut those apples up. And of course the answer was she was wearing a partial denture and that partial denture didn't fit desperately well. So she could no longer incise into an apple uh, without social embarrassment. And she, of course, was therefore using and still having a, a, a good, uh, a healthy nutritional diet, but other people may shy away from it and they may go to, to things which are gonna have more profound impacts and so a broader impact on their overall health. I just made a little note there about Bernie Keyes's original article that it's, it is, of course, um, for occlusal units, so not what I thought as an undergraduate, uh, a shortened dental arch always meant from the lower left five to the lower right five and the opposing in the upper arch. That's what I thought in my mind was a shortened dental arch. That's not actually what Bernie Keyes was describing. What he was describing was four pairs of occlusal units. So that could be, for example, from the four on one side 
uh, to the six on the other uh, and obviously opposing pairs in the upper arch. And as I'm talking to you, um, one second, I'll have a quick sip of water because my mouth is drying out. The importance of your teeth for the actual simple speech process. And this gentleman here was a lovely guy, um, very big, rugged chap, uh, and he had a cleft, so he never had teeth in that area. But without his denture in, he simply couldn't function um, in, in terms of uh, aesthetics. He, that was unacceptable to him, um, but also he couldn't speak properly, he had a pronounced lisp without, without his tongue, uh, with that denture in place. Um, and the, the production of the, the position of those teeth is really important uh, to get that, the fricative uh, sound. So the, the th and the th sounds, which you, you think about it, that's where your tongue is going to produce that, that sound. Uh, and without your, your incisal edge in position, you can't make that sound, or at least you can't make it properly and people will pick that up. And so, and this is really just a sort of side note. So when I'm doing the treatment like this, as I did for this gentleman here, um, I like to do a try-in, so I get a stage where I have the wax up. I'm sure you're all doing a similar sort of thing, not just to look at the appearance of it and the fit and everything else, but just to also check for those particular circumstances. Is this person able to properly enunciate and, and talk to me? And hopefully with a good quality try-in, they should be able to do exactly that. And I mentioned earlier on about occlusal stability, and this is another thing. Clearly, Prof Sam didn't teach me that well when I was an undergraduate. Actually, Sam, I'm sorry, I apologise. That wasn't your fault. That was my inattentiveness as an undergraduate student. Um, when I heard undesirable tooth movement, in my mind, what it meant was over eruption. Um, but of course, that's part of the problem. Um, and Kiliardis did a beautiful, um, uh, a beautiful um, uh, article where they, they looked at study casts and they actually looked at the movements of the teeth over time following extraction. And so over eruption, yes, it does occur, as I would have correctly stated, but what is more common is not the over eruption, but tipping and tilting of those teeth. And I wonder how many of the audience today have actually remembered or thought of the possibility of the tipping and rotation of teeth. And certainly it's something which passed me by until I read that article, which is interesting because I had, of course, should have noticed it, having looked at multiple study casts of patients before, but it's amazing what can just pass you by. And then there's other tissues as well we need to consider replacement, not just the hard tissue, but the soft tissues. And this, um, this lady, uh, you can see, um, I'm not gonna say my clinical photography is the best in the world. And you'll think, well, why haven't you retracted more than that from that top, top photograph? I'm afraid that was her maximum opening. So she had, um, had a, a carcinoma and a hemianaxolectomy followed by radiotherapy. Uh, and the result was that she had about three millimetres of, of, of vertical space for us to get the denture into. And one thing I think which um, you, we, we tend to underestimate as clinicians is the capacity for our patients to adapt. So in that lower picture, that's um, a denture that I made along with one of the wonderful staff at the Eastman Dental Hospital called um, Colin Clark. Uh, Colin was a fantastic um, dental uh, technician, he's now retired. Um, and so we were so worried about trying to get this uh, object in, this huge bum on that right hand side, that we actually made that and may be able to see that there is actually a little line coming along here and it's actually in two parts. And there's magnets holding the whole thing together and I was really proud of myself because I'd come up with this plan and I'd made this careful uh, little, little tool that she could insert one part and then insert the second part and I showed her very carefully at the fit stage. Um, and so that was all going well. I lost a bit of sleep because I worried that she wouldn't be able to get the thing out. So I was expecting a phone call and that night. Didn't get one, saw her for the review a week later. And the very first thing she did to me was smile, say, yep, it's all going fine. And then pop it all out in one go. Uh, and yep, sure enough, she'd worked out how to get the thing in and out, which is astounding. So we, we are not only talking about resin retained bridges here, but we always must consider the alternative options. And for a lot of patients, clearly not in this instance at the front of the mouth, um, one of the simplest and, and most reliable and sensible options, once we've thought about the possibility of, of movement of teeth, which may or may not be you know, something we want to avoid, then actually just accepting the space. And in simple, simple cases, usually in younger patients, we can also consider the, the, the use possibility of orthodontics. And it's a strange thing for me to say as a prosthodontist, someone who's trained to uh, cut people's teeth up. Um, and actually enjoys it. And I'm, I'm happy to say and put my hand in here that I genuinely really do enjoy doing fillings. 
uh, and I'm a bit of a nerd and, and I also like doing things like three quarter crowns and onlays and even seven eighths crowns when I'm allowed to get totally carried away. Um, but actually the truth is that if somebody manages to avoid me as a clinician, they're probably going to end up with a better outcome because everything I do will fail. So if they see an orthodontist and they can place the teeth that way, that's probably going to be a better outcome for me in the longer run. Um, in this instance, so the next thing I've talked about there is, is partial dentures. Now in this instance, this clinical case here, I didn't do the bone grafting, but I did do the implants and, uh, and that's the metal trying stage. And you can see there's really just not enough space in that area. We had to adjust it quite markedly. We got away with it, but only, only narrowly. And on reflection, looking back at that case, I do wonder whether in fact that patient may have been better off with a removable answer rather than the implant and the breach retained answer. She was very happy with a fixed answer, but I do wonder whether it was the appropriate way uh, forward for her. And of course, then there's resin retained bridges, conventional bridge work, which we were all trained on. And now, of course, increasing the implants. Now, I've touched upon this already in terms of longevity, but I think we need to consider the broader implications of what we're doing, particularly as, uh, as either general practitioners or prosthetists, where we're actually starting to damage people's teeth to try and make things last longer. Uh, if we consider the average uh, UK male, well, the average UK male is, oh, therefore I'm clearly above average because I'm no longer 40, I'm past that point now. The average UK male is now uh, 40 years old. And the UK life expectancy for a male is 79. You may think that therefore the 40 year old has only got 51 years of life, but uh, sorry, um, has, has only got um, uh, 39 years of life. That's of course not true because those people have already survived to the point that they're 40 and a, a number of other people unfortunately have not made it to 40 and they're of course bringing the average down. So the average life expectancy for a 40 year old is in fact 91, um, so not 79 at all. And you've got to ask the question of should you or will you manage to get an outcome for your dental treatment which is going to last for the, that kind of time period, so 50 odd years, half a century, well, I'm pretty sure that my work won't last that long. And what if they're a super ager? What if they're somebody who's so wonderful that they're going to make it to 110? Is your dentistry going to last that long? And I suspect the answer, if we're being honest with ourselves, is, is no, it's not. Uh, and so with increasing longevity, and it's a, a marvellous thing, but with increased longevity, I think we need to be very careful and mindful that our patients... Uh, really we should be doing the least treatment, certainly the least destructive treatment and try and uh, maintain their teeth and dentition as functional as possible for as long as possible. Um, as I'm talking about sort of carrying out uh, destructive preparations, I thought I'd touch upon uh, a little bit of literature which looks at various um, things that we're doing when we're carrying out our crown preparations. I'm a self-confessed uh, crown prep uh, person who really enjoys the, the process. But perhaps my patients don't enjoy it quite so much. And if we look at the Ed Edelhoff and, uh, and Sorensen paper, we can see that an anterior tooth, um, when prepared for a, a fairly classical ceramic metal crown, uh, we're removing roughly two thirds to maybe as much as three quarters of the tooth in that process. So it's a highly destructive thing to be doing. Uh, and, on, and the further analysis from Burke and Lucarotti, which uh, this is a fabulous paper, it's a fabulous series of papers in the BDJ uh, dating from 2018. Um, these are, this is the source from over a million cases. So they went to the NHS data and they've looked over a million cases. That's pretty, pretty impressive data. And the 15 year survival rate for crowns is 77%. Now that's a very good figure, but the question you've got to ask is what happens after that? And I'm, unfortunately, I think we all know. And if I just highlight that there, I just put dots around that, you can see on the right hand side is the undamaged tooth. On the left hand side is a typodont which I prepared. This was for, for undergraduate teaching purposes. But you can see on this posterior tooth how much of the tooth I've actually cut away. And on the left hand side, you can see that really that I couldn't have taken, I just transposed that across, I couldn't have taken any less tissue away. That was as conservative as I could possibly manage. Some of you may be looking at that crown preparation and thinking, Guy, that's a very heavy preparation you've done there. Um, and to prove that I'm actually correct on, the, on my figures, um, I put my Williams probe against the side there and you can see it's half a millimetre. So that is what half a millimetre looks like. If, if you're producing less than that, and I certainly find a lot of my undergraduates do, 
then it, particularly for a, a metal crown, so a full gold crown, for example, then you're going to end up with far less material, sort of vocal gold in that area. And the net result is you're going to be putting uh, shearing forces upon your cement lute in, around the neck of the tooth. And that's not going to end well. And shearing forces really is something which we, we as prosthodontists want to avoid at all, at all costs. So I'm going to come back to the topic of shearing force and the implications it has for us multiple times throughout the rest of this presentation. But sticking with the talk about loss of vitality, this is a, a picture very kindly given to me by um, Cavo. Uh, I was over and I'm not uh, doing a plug for Cavo. Um, I was just very impressed with this particular kit, bit of teaching kit that they developed. Um, I was over at, um, at, at AD, uh, which is the Association of um, Dental Education in Europe. They do a, a pan-dental uh, um, conference uh, every, every year or so. Uh, and this presentation here was for, for teaching of students. So that the tutor had prepared that too. So it's a really nice looking preparation. But then you can scan it and you can overlay where the pulp chamber is. And you can see, even with a sensible, well thought out, well executed preparation, just how close you are really getting to that pulp chamber. And you'd think it would be an easy question to answer how many uh, teeth become non-vital as we do our crown preparations. Now I've read uh, numerous articles and the range is enormous. Um, there's articles which are going up to as high as one in five um, and articles stating figures sort of roughly one or two percent. Um, because I couldn't find any consensus articles, I, I'm going to go with Whitworth et al's um, overall, which I thought was a very good overview of this uh, question. And Whitworth um, came to the conclusion there's roughly four to eight percent chance of teeth becoming non-vital 10 years after you carried out your crown preparation. Now, in my mind, that is high enough to make me want to inform every patient that I do a crown preparation on that there is a risk that their tooth may subsequently perish. And given that I've done hundreds, probably thousands by now, um, it, I, I must have killed quite a few pots over time. So let's just come back to the resin retained bridges. I've given you a little bit of potty history of the background there, but a little bit of history about resin retained bridges um, in terms of development. And this, this picture uh, is really one of them um, showing one of the doyons of a resin retained uh, not just bridges, but, but, but resin restorations. And of course it's Bunicor. And it was, it was in the mid fifties that Bunicor um, was doing research around uh, the acid etching or potential for acid etching to be used in dentistry. And he'd been inspired by um, looking at what was going on in industry, actually heavy industry and, and, and um, acid etching of metals and so forth. But the true implications of what he was doing within the dental field didn't come to the forefront for quite some time. And it took until 1960s when uh, Bowen uh, famously came up with the Biz GMA monomer, which is the fun sort of, the, we've got the whole ball rolling on what we now recognize as being sort of bonded technology and all our white fillings and so forth. And it, again, it took a long time before people started to really pick this up uh, beyond just doing fillings. But the, the earliest forms of sort of resin retained bridges would be things like the rochette. Now, uh, some, some people still refer to restorations as a rochette, of course it's not, a rochette was described by rochette in the 1970s and it was a very particular style of resin retained bridge uh, and not one that we really should be using now, except we can still use it. Uh, and I know a number of my colleagues who do far more implant work than I do, um, do use rochette bridges uh, occasionally as a, as a temporary measure because it doesn't particularly stick very well. Um, I, uh, myself have used resin retained bridges, conventional ones, as a temporary measure. And I can tell you, for those people in the audience who have not just done this, uh, don't use a conventional resin retained bridge uh, as a temporary. It can be extremely difficult to remove them, or certainly don't design them the way I'm going to talk further about how you design them. Rochettes, on the other hand, are more readily re re removable uh, and can be utilised, and some people are using them successfully. Um, um, uh, just a little word about sort of, you know, the impact upon bonding. I mean, it has absolutely revolutionized dentistry. I'm going to refer later on to some uh, key texts like Schillingberg and so forth, uh, all of which I strong, still strongly recommend as being excellent books to have a look at certain the fundamentals of prosthodontics. But increasingly, we are moving away from those earlier drafts of Schillingberg's 
where it works, because we're no longer relying purely upon mechanical retention. But again, I'll come back to that later. But sticking with mechanical retention, there's a picture uh, from courtesy of Alistair Stokes, one of my um, old tutors at the London and then later also at the Eastman Dental Hospital. Um, Alistair's never gone back to, to, uh, to New Zealand, but, but he was very kindly gave me a number of his presentations and I've taken that from one of his. And um, you can see that the old fashioned rochette design and he's gonna, we're gonna talk about the more modern designs as we go forward in this presentation. But what I don't want you to do is, is do something like this. And see, so it's, it's quite small. It's not covering an awful lot of the tooth tissue and it's got, it's perforated, there's holes through it. And the reasons for those holes were to also act like almost small rivets um, so that the, the glue, the bond, would go through the hole and make a little lump on the other side. So it's almost like being riveted into place. Um, and the initial ones, as uh, uh, resume restorations, brochettes, and uh, even potentially Michigan style, were considered to really only be relatively short term restorations, as noted by Pettersson. I just made a note of the classical um, article by El Brashi, which is talking about the, the need of taper for our, our cast restoration. So there's a Slightly, I don't know why I put it at that angle, but I, I, don't, I don't know, I might have been feeling arty. Um, but that's a, an onlay preparation that I've done for a, pay, for a, a type of on the case, just to show the, the, the students what I was talking about. But you can see that you've got to make sure everything's actually got correct taper, correct angles. And that's not what we're talking about with our resin retained bridges, far more to do with our bonding process. There is, there is mechanical retention with our resin retained bridges, but it's far more based on micromechanical than macromechanical. And so with the micromechanical, we are really uh, looking at the, the etching um, of, the, of the enamel surface, obviously, as described by Bunicore, and also of the electrical, electrolytically etched surface uh, of, the, of the metalwork. And you can see in those two pictures, the, the, the effect, the roughening uh, at a sort of a microscopic scale. And you can imagine the adhesive just grabbing hold of that and hanging on. Uh, and one of the big leaps forward in resin retained bridges, probably why we're having this conversation now, is that there are now metal primers that we can utilize. And one of the key ones is, um, is this. It's, it's basically, that, that's too long for me to pronounce. Um, and we now shorten it, thank goodness, to, to MDP monomer. And, and that's found in things like Panavia, Panavia 21, et cetera. And, and other things we can also utilize such as Formetta. Um, but I'm just a question I'd like to raise at this point is, if we, because we, we are of course reliant upon the bonding, and we know that bonds do not resist shear forces, so that's things which are going to slide off, so things are going to force it to slide away. Um, if we are looking at, at, at uh, a design of our bridge, surely a, a bridge design for a resin retained bonded bridge, a good one, is going to reduce the potential for shear forces to dislodge our bridge, and I'll come to, to that more of that in more detail later on. But sticking with the bonding just for a moment, I just want to talk a little bit about the some of the fallacies around bonds and bond strengths, because I'm sure we've all, as, as um, qualified practitioners, uh, been talks, uh, been to talks and have listened to various people, usually trying to sell us a dental product, a bond, uh, a composite, whatever it might be, and they'll reassure us that their bond works beautifully. Uh, it's got a massively high bond strength and it works well with enamel and denting. And there's an element of truth to what they're saying. If we look back to the 1980s, a fairly typical bond was going to be uh, to, to enamel uh, with pretty much any of the decent bonds at the time would have produced 25 megapascals in terms of bond strength, which is more than enough. However, to denting, it was only 10 megapascals. So that really wasn't up, up to speed. By the time we got to 2000, you look at the difference between the two, sure, enamel was still, we got a better bond to it, but denty was lagging a little bit behind, but more than adequate. I don't think anyone's going to refute that 30 megapascals is more than capable of holding uh, things in, in place. And certainly I, I use bonding all the time. I do full mouth reconstruction cases where I build up the anterior teeth with composite. There's nothing holding that on other than bond. And it can be highly successful. So the question then is, if we've got these wonderful bond strengths, do we need to worry about it? Well, the simple answer I'm afraid is yes, because, and this is taken from Bush and Jenkins, and admittedly it's 1991, but nothing's really changed because this is a fundamental 
uh, of, of the, the materials we're dealing with and the substructure that we're dealing with, i.e. dentine enamel, and that's not changed. We've got good bond strengths to enamel, we've got better bond strengths now to dentine, but the thing which dictates the, the, the overall bond strength it's not uh, an average of the two, it is the weakest of the two adherents. So it is always the weakest link. So in this case, clearly, it's the, it's the dentine which is going to be limiting your bond. And I'd like to draw your attention to these uh, next uh, points, which is the second and third point on my slide, by Pratty et al, which is the second point, which is that our resin retained cement deteriorates over time, they hydrolyze. So we may get very, very good bond strengths early on, 24 hours, even six months or more, perhaps even a few years. But over time, the hydrolysis is occurring and we're likely to start to get micro leakage. And of course, this is uh, much more likely to happen uh, in a more challenging surface, such as bonding to dentine. And I'd also draw your attention to this article from Way, where we recognize that MDP forms a water resistant chemical bond. The key being, the, the key word being uh, resistant, it is not waterproof. So I'm afraid our bonds and, uh, and everything else we're using all starts to slowly hydrolyze and break down over time in, in water. And unfortunately, of course, the, the human mouth is, is a very fairly fluid environment. If we look at um, some of the longevity, and I'm talking, I'm sort of edging around that as I'm having this discussion. Um, some of the very earliest uh, bits we've got about longevity from the Jamal paper from uh, right at the end of the 1990s. And this was done at the, the Eastman, uh, and they looked at a, a quite a number of different resin protect bridges, but also splints, so metal, metal bonded splints on the back of teeth. And because it was, we were still in the early phase of designing our, our, our bridges and our splints, there really were quite a lot of variation. There was also a lot of variation on different choices of cements. So not surprising then that the success rates were not spectacularly high. Um, but one of the things that really came out of this was the the, the coverage of the incisal edge was really important for getting a much better outcome, as was generous coverage of the lingual and palatal surfaces. And I'm going to touch back on that later on, but a couple of key design features for if you want to have good success for your resin retained bridges is to ensure that you cover the incisal or occlusal edge, uh, and also that you cover as much of the lingual or palatal surface, what's sometimes called the, the wraparound on the tooth. And the median survival rate from this paper was actually under eight years, uh, just under eight years. Um, another paper, was much more recent, was done by Paul King um, and, and his group uh, down in Bristol. And um, Paul and his group found that, I think because things have moved on, the designs have changed, um, they found a couple of things which we should be taken out of. One of the things that was really important for success was operator experience. And you're going to see that one occur several times during this presentation. Operator experience, in other words, have you made the right choice? Have you selected the right tooth? Have you done this the right way? Made a profound impact upon the outcome. But what was really interesting from their paper was that their failures were occurring in the first sort of four to five year range. And after that, you can see it just goes flat. And they censored the paper after 15 years because nothing was failing. So they had 80% success at 10 years and it just carried on like that. And all of those failures, the 20%, uh, the had all occurred in the first five years. So if you're gonna get failure, you're gonna get it early with resin retained bridges. And in many ways, it's quite a good thing. So I know that and I warn my patients that I'm sorry, this might not work. And if it doesn't, we can look at alternative options. But once you get out of the woods, once you get out of that four or five year range, you're probably pretty good for a long period of time. Um, slight joke there from, from, uh, from myself there, uh, not necessarily a great joke, but you, you, might, you might be wondering what that picture is. And that's actually a picture of my head. Uh, and you can see that there's uh, some gray hairs in there these days. And that's because I, I teach undergraduates on a fairly regular basis, I think. But the reason I put that photograph up was I want to bring out the graying problem, as, as Ming Tay once described back in the 80s. And that's when you put a, a piece of metal behind a tooth. It tends to make the whole thing go grayish in color. So if you want, one of the things you want to avoid then it when resin retained bridges, you really don't want to be doing this for patients who've got very thin or very translucent teeth because it's going to look, it's going to look at that grayness. It's going to start to lose that, that, that vigor, that, that color that you know is right for a tooth. And one way you can test that very easily, I'm sure you can do masking when you get to the fit stage, but it's a bit late. 
um, is you can just put something metallic behind that tooth and see what it's going to look like. Um, we also know that you're, uh, you need to um, acid etch these, uh, uh, sorry, not as you acid, acid etch the tooth, but you use a, a lumina um, uh, particle, preferably 50 microns, to adjust the, uh, the, the, the metal surface for maximum bonding, but also that we know from ways of work that yes, you do get a better result, result in terms of outcome for, uh, for success. If you have, uh, oh, something, someone's got their speaker on, so if you could just turn that off, that'd be great. Um, so there's a, thank you. Um, so you get, a better, you get a better outcome if you get, uh, res if you do these cementations under uh, rubber dam. So it, it can be quite challenging, but definitely worth doing. So one of the problems we need to further explore, so I've talked about failures, uh, and one of the key reasons for failure is flexion. And Pedersen noted uh, that the technical complications in debonding do occur. And this is just supporting what's already been said by, by King earlier on. The, one of the things that's really important is having a, enough thickness and enough rigidity, and I'll come back to that in a moment, but enough rigidity to your bridge framework to prevent it from flexing and twisting. Because it's that, the flexing and twisting of your bridge, which is gonna put your cement loot under, under load. It's gonna put it under shearing forces once again, and that's the thing we really don't want to do. As I mentioned already, we don't want to have an unperforated wing, uh, sorry, a perforated wing, we want to have an unperforated wing, where the minimum thickness of that wing is going to be 0.7 millimetres. So there's a picture uh, from London, and that's the St Paul's Cathedral uh, in the background on a rather lovely day. And in the foreground, you can see what's known as the, the Millennium Bridge. And the Millennium Bridge, when it was uh, first put up and first started to be used, became very quickly known by the locals as the Wobbly Bridge. And the reason for it being known as the Wobbly Bridge is as you walked across it, you could feel the whole thing sway. And it actually cost an absolute fortune to fix this thing. Uh, it cost millions of pounds. Uh, and it was some very unusual harmonics being set up as people walked across, everyone tended to start to step in motion with the sway and just therefore made the sway worse. And they said, well, why are you, are you talking about that? Well. That is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, uh, that's today. Um, but this is what the Tacoma Narrows Bridge used to look like. And that is rather spectacular. Bear in mind, this is a full-sized bridge. That is a car parked on the center of the bridge. And the locals apparently used to call the, the bridge Galloping Gertie and would dare each other to drive across it in high winds. Um, quite spectacular movement on that. Well, you'll be unsurprised to see the, the final outcome for this bridge, uh, and I'm afraid it was catastrophic failure. Now, as we don't want to have that, we want to make sure that our bridges are rigid. Just making a little note there about um, further causes of failure, occlusal coverage I've already mentioned and incisal edge again. What you're doing is you're making sure the force is being directed, hopefully down the long axis of the tooth, and therefore reducing that shear force. Um, and that's the wing, but we also need to consider the pontic. And the pontic, uh, if it's involved in lateral excursive movements, will once again end up producing a shearing force. So when you want to be placing res resin bonded restorations, so you want to make sure that all the contacts, the heavy contacts, are all on the, the wing itself, with only very light contacts on, on uh, ICP, on the uh, pontic and no uh, contacts in lateral excursive movements. Otherwise, what you can achieve, and I have seen this being done, um, where someone had cemented a cantilever to an upper left one. Unfortunately, the upper left two was involved in the protrusive movement, and as the patient was grinding forward, they were pushing that tooth, and the net result was that the whole upper left one was rotated, uh, and, the, and the lateral and the pontic came forward and out, and we had to then put that back in, and that was an, a case of orthodontics uh, for the patient. Other possible causes of failures, these uh, pictures are courtesy of my great friend Richard Tucker, who very kindly gave these images to me. Um, so what he's done here is he's done extraction of those um, lower anteriors because unfortunately there's basically no bone around them. And then he's done immediate fit on the day of the extraction and put the resin, resin retained bridges in. And those resin retained bridge uh, design you can see there, you can just about see how the insert is coming up onto the tip, just onto the tip of the tooth there. And that's what I'm talking about with the incised edge coverage. It doesn't have to come all the way over. It doesn't have to be really ghastly and ugly. And you can see it 
in that particular clinical photograph. But remarkably, because the, the back of the mouth is a poorly lit area, there isn't much of a light bulb back there, then actually it's amazing how these things disappear. And I always explain to my patients when I'm doing resin retained bridges that I will put a bit of metal just over the edge. They usually look fairly horrified at that option. Uh, and then I say that I can cut it off later if it's bothering you, but it's likely to make it less secure. And so we go for it. And after that, I've placed it, we almost invariably forget all about it. And a few don't, and I will adjust it later on. And so far, I've still got away with that. You don't need much coverage onto the incised edge to make a world of difference. And going back to the periodontal condition, clearly we want to make sure our patients are cleaning this. So exactly the same things we've been doing normally for conventional bridge work. We go over using uh, things like um, super floss or TPs or single tufted brushes and really get them in and around those abutments. And critically, of course, we want to make sure that our, our, restor our restoration itself is, is highly polished. So it's nice and cleansable and not likely to encourage bacteria to be caught in that area. And talking about conventional bridge work, all of you I'm sure are experienced about assessing teeth for bridges and for crowns. It's exactly the same set of rules. Nothing changes here. You still want to make sure your patient is dentally fit, everything is nice and stable. We do need to consider the, uh, the, the standard things such as axial inclination, the amount of crown to root ratio, are we making something just too long and therefore a long lever arm and therefore likely to fail? What's the degree of periodontal support? Critically, I'm talking thinking of bone levels here. Um, and of course, our prosthodontic assessment, is there really enough tooth left? And in this instance, of course, I want as much enamel as physically possible. And if the tooth is vital, that's all taken from a, a nice um, article by Jury. But I'd also like to add to that list from Jury's article, this consideration as well from Pettison which I think is also similarly important, not only for a fix, but also for, so not only for conventional, but also for less retained restorations. And that is looking at short clinical crowns. I've certainly seen scenarios where people have taken a perfectly reasonable tooth, uh, classically a lower premolar, done the preparation, by the time you finish preparing a lower premolar, and a lot of people, unless they've had a degree of periodontal disease, there's not an awful lot left, and it was therefore probably relatively contraindicated. So well worth having a look at the the, the, the clinical crown height, but also the amount of space, interarch space you've got between the maxilla and the mandible. Is there physical space to put something in here? And it's not uncommon for me when I'm doing uh, removal orthodontics that posteriorly, typically in a sort of area of seven or so, I won't replace it with a tooth. I'll just have the, the flange of the denture in that area because there isn't enough space in a lot of cases. So looking at the framework, I don't want to encourage you to, to make a framework that looks like the top picture. That was actually done by a milling process at the London Hospital, uh, and the technicians and, and I were sort of sitting looking at this thing, scratching our heads, uh, trying to work out how we were going to improve it. We didn't fit this one for a patient for the simple reason it didn't do the things we wanted it to do. It didn't actually wrap round as far as it possibly could and get right into that embrasure area. It also didn't come quite far enough onto the incisal or cuspal tip we really wanted it to get onto. Um, so we didn't do that, and we ended up actually making it by hand. And that is one of the problems with the, the sort of move to, to, to CAD CAM technology, and which, which is a wonderful thing. It just has limitations. And in this instance, um, the scanner just simply wasn't up to it uh, to be able to, to do what you can do with a lost wax technique. And I just already said before that we need to be using uh, 0.7 millimeter thick wings, but of course we should be using nickel chromium. Um, maximum coverage on the lingual and platelet surface, as indicated by uh, Jamal and also by King. And of course, occlusal coverage, as mentioned by Ibbotson in 2004. I made a note about um, cantilevered or fixed fix designs, because there seems to be some confusion in the literature around this. And generally speaking, cantilever tends to work much, much better. So you get much lower failure rate with cantilever. And this is taken from the King article again. You can see the top one in blue, that's the cantilevers doing far better. And then you've got in green, you've got the, the other, the fixed fix, which are, are not doing, performing quite so well. So far more, double the number of failures. I've made an asterisk on that because there are occasions when actually a fixed fix design works very well. So on that previous picture, you could see um, provided by Alistair Stokes that there's a three to three, so it's in the lower arch, it's three to three, but there are no anterior teeth. And it's nice and thick, nice and rigid, and that worked very well. So the occasion I use fix fixed for resin retained bridges is classically in the three to three region. You can do it in the maxilla and the mandible. Usually in the mandible, it's easier because you've got tend to have a greater height, greater space. 
you can make a nice thick uh, uh, resin, rigid resin, uh, sorry, a rigid framework for your resin retained bridge. In the maxilla, you're often struggling for space, so you may or may not be able to do it, but it's, for some people you can achieve it in the maxilla too. And just that you know, I've already mentioned Schillingberg once before on this presentation, I just want to just reiterate there uh, about the, the risks of failure and also of flexion based upon the length of the, of the uh, bridge itself. And you can see from that picture that as that bridge is bending, the bar in the foreground, as the bar bends, it lifts up and away from the abutments. And if you had a, some glue underneath that bar, you could see it's being pulled. So it's being pulled away. And actually our, our adhesives don't work very well in that direction. They're far better and far stronger in compression. And that's not what we're going to achieve if we've got a flexible bridge. And one, it's not just the length which is going to lead to flexure, but one of the other problems that can lead to flexure is when we start to try and make, quite rightly, our bridge designs to be as cleansable as possible. So the embrasure space with the nickel chrome needs to be at least, I would have said, um, not the embrasure space, but sorry, the, um, the connector area needs to be at least three millimeters in height and therefore roughly five millimeters in cross-sectional area. That will give you reasonable embrasure space on most patients. The problem comes when you don't have that physical space and then it becomes difficult to clean. And that's the, the example there. You can see the, the top picture and then you go to the bottom picture, you've got an even longer span and the effect, the impact upon that flexure is actually enormous. Just by going that extra unit, you get far, far more flexure. You can also use um, resin retained bridges for um, retention in orthodontic cases, and that tends to be extremely successful. And by there, by retention, what I mean is actually um, bonding it across the midline, so it's actually attached to two centrals, so it's not the classic cantilever, which we're generally recommending. It's bonded to the palatal aspect of both centrals after the orthodontics have been done. That's then going to retain the two centrals in that position, and then you're replacing the two laterals um, with, with your, with your pontics. Mentioning pontics, looking at general pontic space, um, I'm sure everyone's aware of the different styles of pontics. I can't think of any good reason for ever using the first one, which I've highlighted there with, a, with a, uh, an arrow. Um, I do use all of the others in various modes and guises, and they're all appropriate under certain limited conditions, uh, but I certainly never use uh, the one on the far left. I've mentioned occlusion. Uh, I've already talked about the, the need to avoid um, involving the pontic in lateral excursive movements, but try and make sure that um, the, the pontic itself is involved in light contact uh, under, the, under uh, the static ICP. And of course, if we're talking about occlusion, it begs the question of, well, most of my patient's teeth touch, so how do I get the thing in? Because when I do a conventional bridge, I'm cutting tooth tissue away. What I encourage you to do if you're not already doing it is to try a non-destructive approach to placing your restorations. And we can do this by using the dial principle, in other words, to put them in high. That has got risks, and I'll talk those a little bit more uh, in just a second. But to, to thinking about the dial approach, dial wrote a number of articles, but they started in the 1970s. And um, so with, if I, if I look at the dial principle, we consider what's going on. I've like just removed the rest of the teeth, just make things easier. But if you consider just the, the anterior and the posterior teeth, you can see the way the forces are being directed with the patient clo closing together. It's broadly speaking along the long axis of the tooth. The problem is if we jack the patient's bite open, if we put something in between, that can happen. So you can see the back teeth are apart now. And if I just put a metal shin, a wing, in, in other words, on the palatal aspect of let's say a central, my problem is my force may well now have moved in an anterior position and I'm now driving that tooth forwards in an orthod with an orthodontic force. And that can produce that problem I told you about where the patient's uh, tooth just rotated in the lateral walk forwards. So we really don't want that to happen. And the way to avoid that is to produce a platform. So when I do these, I, I get them waxed up by the lab and I check them before they're made into the metal um, or scanned, but um, I want to see what it's gonna look like. I really want my patient to be biting on a platform to be, again, driving it along the long axis of the tooth. Now at this stage, of course, you've still got the, those anterior teeth are in contact and the posterior teeth are no longer in contact. And your patient may not like that very much. So you do need to warn them that that is a risk. Of course, we are gonna be increasing the load on any teeth which are currently in contact. And therefore doing this against heavily restored teeth 
could be a risk, and there certainly needs to be discussed and, and agreed with whether you are willing to accept the possibility of fracture, because they can occur. But we are producing uh, orthodontic forces, so therefore we could get adverse tooth movement. What we hope is going to happen is that everything's going to come back together. But it may not. So I always warn all my patients that when I place a restoration in high, that I may not get the outcome I want. But you can be forewarned that you might get adverse movements. And the best way of doing that is to look at the radiographs and look at the study casts, look at the root form and try and work out where that tooth wants to go. Now, I've, I know this because I have got it wrong. I have done a full mouth reconstruction for a patient. Thankfully, it was a dentist who forgave me for my mistake. Um, and I didn't restore the upper, I think it was his upper right eight. Um, and it was intentional. I was never planning on restoring the upper right eight. But everything else was restored. So I left that tooth out of the occlusion. What I didn't think of was to look at the root form. And the root form was one of those classic eights with a distal curve to it. And it was in contact with the distal aspect of the seven. I increased the vertical, everything set up in beautifully. And then the eight started to over erupt. And as it over erupted, it just followed its natural eruption pathway and it curved away from the seven and produces an unpleasant gap between the seven and the eight, which the patient then couldn't clean, kept getting food caught in it. Now I took the eight out, which resolved the problem. And so thankfully it was a colleague and he forgave me for my blunder. Um, but so I'll just advise all of you to, to not make exactly the same mistake. Um, some people still um, talk about uh, uh, modifying teeth for, uh, for carrying out resume bridges and to a limited degree, I would agree with that, but only to a very limited degree and certainly not. And it's not that I, I think that Thompson and Leviticus have got this wrong, but what they were talking about was in 1982, this was a specific Maryland bridge design. We're not doing Marylands anymore. We're doing resident retained bridges. So we really don't need to be doing any kind of preparation at all. Now I will touch upon that in a moment. Um, actually, we will do preparation under certain circumstances. But just to start off with, um, you may want to modify uh, the, the um, axial surface very, very slightly, almost just tickling it. Try and make it slightly more parallel um, just to improve, make it easier for you to see to your preparation. Uh, from King's article, we know that anything more than just the most minimal uh, of modification to the tooth is likely to produce much more in terms of failure. So we try to avoid it wherever we sensibly can. But I have and do still very, very slightly adjust perhaps a mesial surface of a, a canine or maybe, maybe a, a distal surface of a lateral when I'm replacing the resin retained bridge just to get greater encompassment of the tooth to try and make the whole thing uh, easier to seat. Um, and basically you, you will get more wraparound in that process. And uh, one, one of my colleagues, Jeff St. George, also at the Eastman, uh, also noted, made a note of that as well. Um, Sass and Kern um, have been doing some work which is more to do with ceramic restorations. I'll talk about those later. Uh, and for those, they are doing uh, some very, very minimal uh, reductions, but that is not for retention purposes. It is purely so that they can locate their restoration accurately time after time after time to try and limit the amount of cement loop that they've got and therefore get maximum uh, bonding strength. Talking of maximum bonding strength, of course, on occasion we, we get failure, we get this. And of course, I've had this. Uh, and if you're doing resident retained bridges, as King has said already, you will get failures on occasion. We need to consider that perhaps from Marinello's work, that if you've got multiple failures, there's probably a better reason for it. And there's probably a good reason not to carry on down that process. One of the ones I had the most spectacular failure with was uh, my lab decided to make a resin retained bridge for me. And for a reason only known to them, they decided to make it out of precious metal. I think because I like doing gold work, they thought I'd like it to be made out of precious metal. Um, it was a beautiful looking object. It fitted like a glove and it would not stay on. And it couldn't stay on because I, it would, there was no bonding to the oxide layer because it wasn't an oxide layer. And it took me a while to work out why this kept failing. Unfortunately, my patient did not forgive me uh, and uh, after I'd um, I think for the second time, then it's when I worked out what was going on, um, and then I, I offered to replace it free. He, he decided to leave the practice, and obviously thought I was a complete fool. So yes, yeah, so I, I recommend you you don't make that error. Please do ask for a nickel chrome. I think I did, but I think the lab just uh, got that one wrong for me. 
clearly you're going to need to remove the cement. So don't just rebond it. Uh, there's no use having layer upon layer of cement on there. Clean it all up properly. That's extremely care, extremely careful, uh, meticulous work, preferably done with loops if you've got them, um, and very, very easy to damage the underlying structure. We really want to preserve that, that enamel. And of course, you've got to recondition the wing as well. So that means, again, use a, a 50 micron uh, sandblaster. Now, this is a, a picture uh, taken from um, a master's thesis by one of my master's students, who Christos who's uh, very kindly let me use this image. And the reason I put it in is, is to do with ceramics because they are potentially, but only potentially the future of resin retained bridges. I'm not currently myself using them. I know a number of colleagues who are. Um, one of the, in fact, the, 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 the co-author with this paper was um, Shaq at the, the London Hospital. And Shaq is doing quite a lot of work on resin retained bridges. Uh, and he's seen uh, in terms of ceramic resin retained bridges and he's getting good outcomes, but I'll explore that in a second. One of the things I wanted to point out, the limitations, um, what we've got here, that picture was meant to represent the, um, the embrasure area, so the, the cross section thickness of the connector. And the nickel chrome, as I've already recommended, it needs to be five millimeter squared. You can see the mean fracture force for a nickel chrome, in fact, it wasn't fracture, it was bending force, was a thousand newtons. The same sized connector has only a third of the strength. And if you start thinking about your cases, you start thinking about your, um, your study casts for those cases, you might want to be doing resin retained bridges. You realize that a lot of your patients simply won't have nine millimeters cross-sectional area for the connector to be rigid enough to actually withstand the forces. And that may be why you're getting better results with certain cases than with other cases. Now, I apologize for the picture on the right. Um, I'm not intending you to read that. The point of me putting that up, and some of you are now probably staring very closely at the screen, that's all the sort of different ways people are currently trying to bond zirconia to basically anything else. Um, zirconia is a fantastic material, but one of the great drawbacks is it's incredibly difficult to bond to. And really, the problem is this. Uh, I think Man Manso has really sort of hit the nail on the head. There is no consensus as the best surface conditioning method for bonding our zirconia restorations. What we do know is that uh, certain things like um, AP APA, so airborne particle abrasion and adhesive monomers are showing some kinds of um, uh, potential, but it's too early at this stage to really know. We know that zirconia bridges have twice the number of failures of uh, conventional bridges, uh, and this is probably largely down to, to failures in bonding because you, it's extremely difficult to bond them, if not impossible. And let's hope not impossible, but uh, they're certainly very difficult. And we also know, like uh, all these other things, that contamination of the surface is likely to be detrimental. Again, I apologize about this picture too, but I, the only take home bit I really want for you is that on the left hand side of that graph in the light blue is a series of different bonds. On the right hand side in the darker blue, is the same bonds, but looked at after six months of um, aging the samples in water. So on the left-hand side, you've got various bonds. Um, Reliax is on the far left-hand side, uh, and then uh, Reliax Unisem is on the far right-hand side of that light blue area. And you can see that I mean, Reliax is a perfectly good cement, adhesive resin cement is a perfectly good um, cement, but not, it was never designed for this purpose. So it gives a very low bond strength. So it's clearly not the appropriate bond to be using. It does, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's later uh, cousin, Reliax Unisem, does give a really good high bond strength. It's over 35 megapascals, but that then drops after six months. It's still the best, uh, best one we've got of that particular uh, group of bonding agents. It's not saying it's the best, but it's certainly of that particular group of bonding agents. Um, and it's, it's dropping down and you've got to ask the question, is it still good enough? And that is a debate. I don't think anyone knows the answer to that at this point. Something else which a lot of people haven't really seemed to have hit yet in the literature is the possible risk of wear. Now, um, zirconia, monolithic zirconia, and I would certainly strongly encourage people not to be using uh, laminate uh, zirconias uh, as conventional bridges posteriorly because we know we get spectacular failure, degloving of the laminate layer. Uh, but monolithic seems to work pretty well. Um, we know that monolithic zirconia exhibits comparable wear of the enamel when compared to metal ceramic crowns. Now, for those colleagues in this meeting who've been out for any period of time, you will all, I'm sure, 
have seen patients who've had maxillary uh, surround metal crowns or PFM, some people tend to call them, where the, the palatal surface has been adjusted perhaps or, or maybe just become worn and rough over time. And the outcome over a long period of time is that the lower teeth start to wear down. And we just don't know whether isoconia might do the same thing. Some people have postulated that in fact, it will almost self repair and become uh, less of a problem over time. They might be right. But what Askeval Upshaw has pointed out quite rightly is that we need to know what's going on. And I'd much rather know those things that, than, than do it myself. So I'd rather somebody else has the failure. So at the moment, I think it's an interesting area. It's something I'm certainly watching. Uh, I may well consider in the relatively near future doing this sort of thing, but I'm shying away from currently. Um, just speaking about longevity, so I, I have mentioned already Kern uh, and also Shack at the, the London Hospital. Um, so this is a, 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 a ceramic restoration of a hyperdontia case. And you can see it's, it's, it's breaking quite a number of the rules that I've already talked about with nickel chrome. But of course, that is nickel chrome. This is a different material and therefore it probably requires perhaps a different set of rules. How long are they lasting for according to Kern? Well, for 10 year survival rate is almost 100%. That is absolutely fabulous. So it's difficult to refute that Kern's work is working. And also um, Shaq is getting similarly high um, success and survival ratings as well. The thing I would draw your attention to is the limitations on the studies, relatively low numbers of cases so far. So I'm not yet willing to go down this path like Shaq has, uh, certainly on a research basis, and he is having very promising results. So that's really, really good and encouraging. Um, if we have a look at the graph uh, at the bottom there, you can see that the, the top sort of black line is to the patients who had congenitally missing teeth, and it's almost 100% success over a prolonged period of time, it's a relatively short period, 168 months, but over a prolonged period of time, you're getting almost 100% success in those cases. You get quite a lot of drop off when you start looking at patients who've got teeth missing for other reasons or because of trauma. And perhaps that's because somebody who's traumatized their front teeth is more at risk of doing the same mistake, whatever it might be, uh, and therefore causing more trauma and therefore losing the restoration again. Uh, if I just click that, you can see what Kern's doing. He, they, they are um, doing minor preparation to that service, not for retention, but just to get that restoration absolutely seated. So it's definitely home. And that will critically put a very thin layer of loot in that area, thin layer of bond, and therefore hopefully reduce the shearing forces being applied to that. So a word about longevity. Well, I think Shah and, and Laverty, uh, what they wrote in 2017 is still current and certainly my watchword at the moment. Um, I think that there's potential, uh, but on, the, on balance at the moment, I'm still using the, the metallic uh, process rather than ceramics. But I think the ceramics are encouraging uh, and, and potentially could well be the future. And just a uh, last couple of things I'd like to do uh, is just a, just a quick word about a couple of clinical cases. Um, I'm afraid I didn't take a photograph of these in, in situ. Um, this is after I had to cut them off uh, because these were so well retained I could not get them off any other way. So the horrible mess attached to that is the fact I've actually cut them away. Um, a patient came to see me, he was completely dentist in the upper arch and the lower arch. All he had left was that five, those five teeth. Um, but three of them were heavily compromised. Now, he didn't want a lower denture, but he really needed some more support. Um, so we decided to, with, with full patient consent, restore him with some resin retained bridges. And they functioned exceptionally well for an eight year period. And then he rapidly exfoliated uh, several of those teeth. Now those teeth had a very poor prognosis to begin with. They were already severely probably compromised, um, grade one mobile, and you could have argued even potentially to taken them out uh, back in 2009, uh, but we didn't. And we kept them, maintained them. And he was happy with that. And he had then another eight years without having a denture. Uh, so I had to then uh, take out the remaining tooth uh, and provide him with, with a prosthesis which he was less happy with, but, but he was actually willing to accept by, by that time. Um, just one final clinical case. This was a picture very kindly provided for me by my colleague at the London Hospital, Tim Friel. Uh, and this isn't one of Tim's cases. Uh, he saw this case uh, come in to see him and this was a completely coincidental finding. There was a completely different problem. This was still functioning perfectly well. Uh, and I just want to say for all the rules that I've gone through, all the various things that I think you need to consider, the material choices, the design, the thickness, the rigidity, et cetera, et cetera. Use cantilevers, don't make them uh, bonded at both ends. The 
This thing has worked for 27 years. It's been a spectacular success. And that's it. Um, so in summary, um, I hope you've enjoyed this, this session as much as I have. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, talking to you today. Uh, I'd like to thank again, uh, Sir Van and also uh, Prof Sam for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. And um, uh, resin retained bridges, I think they're a really good use uh, of your time. I think they could be highly successful. You just need to be careful with your, with your planning as you would be with any conventional bridge. You know, I just stop sharing and uh, I can come back to the room. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Lamborn, for a very enlightening uh, uh, lecture and a really updated one and uh, where we have the facts and the figures and it's really a clinical dentistry uh, with uh, actually you can call it as evidence based because you quote a lot of articles and very recent ones as well as old ones. I'm sure uh, any of the postgraduates who are with us will find it extremely useful to follow up on these articles as well. So uh, is it all right if I proceed directly to the questions that have been sent in? Absolutely, and um, on that note, with the regards to the, um, the articles, I have actually, I didn't show you, but at the end of the presentation, I've got all the articles listed out. So uh, if, if, Wonderful. If, if you've got postgraduates uh, or even colleagues who are in practice want to go and read those articles, I'm more than happy to uh, provide. It's probably the best way would be to provide them by you, maybe, something like that? Yeah, I think that'll be best, yeah. Well, uh, the first question is, uh, uh, one uh, uh, colleague of mine, he has asked, uh, what is the superior one, MDP monomer or formator? Um, yeah, it's a perfectly good question. Uh, I have to say I, I use the MDP monomer, so uh, uh, am I, am I, no, I won't. I was, I was going to give a pitch for a particular brand, but I won't do that, because so, they're not paying <laughs> enough, so I won't. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I think, I think the answer is, yeah, so it will cover the, the basic. Uh, well, and uh, another uh, colleague has asked, how much of thickness of resin would you recommend? Well, that's a really good question because you, you really don't want much at all. Um, the answer is an absolute minimum thickness. So um, I couldn't give you an exact figure and I probably ought to be able to, and I haven't thought of that question, so it's a really good question. I, I, I'm guessing it's probably around about 25 microns, something of that <laughs> ilk. Um, oh. But basically, it's an absolutely as thin as you can get it layer. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is if you, there's almost like a, uh, there's almost a logic, isn't there? That the more glue is going to be better. But, but actually, oh, yeah. that, that's not what happens. Um, we know that our bond is going to work. We know it's going to, to stick enamel to the bond, to the bond, to the restoration. That's fine. That's a given. Um, where it tends to, to fail is that interface in the central portion, which is the bond itself. That is where it's likely to fail, or potentially, as I've been talking about various materials, to the, the interface of the, of the material itself. It very rarely fails, if ever, to the enamel. Um, so, that, oh. that, so if you have a very thin layer, you're reducing the risk of ending up with shearing forces being generated. And I mentioned that probably know, half a dozen times or more during the presentation. That's the absolute thing you must avoid is shearing forces on your restorations. Got that. Beautiful. Um, there's another question. Um, uh, there's a lot of uh, comments which are coming in, uh, recommending or rather commending you for an amazing lecture. Uh, uh, there's another question with the answer. Can you combine a racing retain retainer with a conventional retainer at the other end with a mobile joint? Yes, you, you can. Um, it, it has been done. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, other people have tried it and it's usually not ended well. So I would generally recommend not to do it. And of course, uh, I think what the, the, the person asking the question is, is really asking is, is whether or not you actually, uh, we have what we call, obviously we call fixed movable bridges. But mm -hmm. the, the, almost the term fixed movable is really a bit of a fallacy because once you lock the fixed movable into position, it, you could almost consider it to actually be one functional piece. It, they really shouldn't be moving independently. So um, I, 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 the question is a good one, um, and people have gone down that pathway. And like a lot of things, where you're starting to sort of push the envelope on things, it, it's not likely to end well. So I wouldn't encourage it as a process. Okay. 
uh, as uh, as the construction part of the material would go, would you rather go for zirconia resin resin bridges or the cobalt chromium ones? I, I would certainly personally still be using nickel chrome, although I, I'm perfectly happy to accept the work done by Kern and also by Shack. Um, they're getting really encouraging results. I think it's fantastic, a really, really good. Um, I'm certainly not refuting that they're getting great results on their uh, hyperdontia cases, but I'm often not dealing with hyperdontia cases. I'm often dealing with, with different scenarios. Um, and I think there's probably, what we'll probably find, and I could be wrong, but what we'll probably find is that you end up with a scenario where you have two different types of resin retained bridges. Certain circumstances, the ceramic may be the go-to option. And yet in other cases, you think actually no, the metals are the go-to option. Okay, got that. I think I have gone through all the questions that have been forwarded. Uh, shall I give them about uh, one or two minutes for them to uh, forward any more questions if they have? Yeah, I'm perfectly happy just for people to, to come up with any other additional questions just for a minute or so. Um, and just in case there are no additional questions, I just like to say now again, you know, thank you very much. Uh, I know you've taken time out of your day. Um, so uh, you know, I appreciate the fact you've been sitting there listening to me whittering on in my spare room. So, uh, yeah, it's good. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> thank you, Guy, very much uh, for an excellent presentation. I like the evidence you presented. Uh, yeah, appreciate that. That was very, very valuable. I hope, uh, City Man, you have a record of uh, all that. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah we have recorded yeah, yeah. everything and it'll be soon on uh, YouTube, hopefully. I guess I'll have to say the goodbye lines. Yeah, I've seen a few messages flash up from people saying thank you. And, uh, yeah. and thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that greatly. And if that's the case, I think we're going to draw the, the meeting to, to a close. Yes, I think I think he's uh, I think he's you not. Know, well, anyway, on, on uh, behalf of Sri Lanka Dental Association, and I would uh, really thank uh, the our speaker, Professor Guy Lambon, and um, Professor D Y D Samaravikrama, who has uh, be, been with us like uh, I don't know from. I mean, the time I entered. <laughs> Uh, practicing. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. I really enjoyed your lecture. I hope our listeners from all over the world did too. Um, thank you very much. There will be another lecture from the Dr. Zirimavan and we will be emailing you about the next one soon. Thank you very much and have a good night.